Welcome to the Weekly Bioanalysis, a KCAS podcast. Hello and welcome to the 24th episode of the Weekly Bioanalysis. My name is John Perkins and I'm a Senior Scientific Advisor for all things related to LCMS technologies. I've been with KCS for a year, but I've been in bioanalytical for around 26 years. I'm here with my co-host, Dominic Guarino. Hello, my name is Dominic Guarino, and I'm the Senior Scientific Advisor for LBA Biomarkers and Flow Cytometry. I've been with KCS for about seven years, uh, almost eight now, and I've been in the bioanalytical space for 26 years. Today's podcast, as always, is brought to you by KCS Bioanalytical and Biomarker Services. KCS is a bioanalytical laboratory located in Kansas City, Kansas, serving the pharmaceutical and biotech industries for over 40 years now. Dom and I are senior scientific advisors at KCS, and either or both of us are available to answer any questions you may have regarding this podcast or any of KCS's services. We're thrilled to have you listening again. As mentioned, this will be our 24th week recording this podcast. So if you're interested, the other episodes can be found at kcasbio.com. As a reminder, you can follow us on Twitter at, at the Weekly Bio and at kcasbio. We started this podcast because the current business environment prevents face-to-face communication. We're broadcasting from completely different places. I'm in upstate New York, Dom is in Kansas City, and Jeremy, our producer, is in Missouri. This weekly podcast gives us the chance to connect with all of you, and we hope there's a chance for you to get to know us too. And even more, it's a chance for you to get to know KCAS and the services we provide. As always, a review of the latest news and resources and then a focus on a topic of our choosing before discussing any feedback we've had from you. We're constantly looking for topics and we'd be happy to discuss something that you want us to cover. Then we will wrap up and give you a little teaser for next week, letting you know what is coming in the future. So again, we're thrilled to have you here and we're looking forward to a fun episode today. To kick us off, Dom is going to go over today's agenda and podcast topic before we jump into the news and resources section. Dom. Yeah, John, we got a jam-packed podcast number 24. We're going to focus on non-GLP, non-clinical drug development. This is part two of three in our series. The focus will be on discovery LCMS and universal assays. The agenda topics are um, defining uh, what we call discovery LCMS and what the universal assay is. We're going to talk about the role of drug discovery in drug development. And lastly, we'll touch on how, how important a CRO is in uh, your drug discovery and universal assay programs. So John, um, let's just jump right into the news and notes. Today's first topic is on President Trump's COVID treatment. That made big news. Obviously, he's recovered. He's out there doing his thing. But let's, uh, let's take a look at what he took, John, which is really interesting. The biggest um, sort of um, treatment he got was that monoclonal antibody therapy from Regeneron, the, the Regen uh, antibody pair that is, um, you know, highly effective, sort of, not sort of, it's initial, it, it has duality about it. It can be used as a vaccine, but President Trump used it as a therapeutic. It appears to have worked, although that was just one of many things he took. Um, the other was remdesivir. And of course, we've touched on that quite a bit. It's a, it's an antiviral drug uh, targeting uh, respiratory viruses and so forth. And um, those are the two major things. And then I'm going to quickly round out the other items he took, which was dexamethasone, obviously. And that's another um, drug that is making headway in therapies for um, COVID. And, and that's a steroid to help with uh, inflammation and abate the um, effect of COVID-19, as well as he took a gamut of zinc, vitamin D, um, the antacid, uh, femtidine, uh, John, I'm sure you know that one, melatonin and aspirin. Sorry. What was the, it's the Pepsid, right? Is the, um, antacid you took melatonin and aspirin. So, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things he took, John. So I, I don't know if that's going to be like the standard of care. Um, I certainly uh, feel like there are treatments out there. They're all going to be a little unique, but I would fall short of saying we have a cure for COVID by any stretch, but pretty cool. interesting stuff. And, you know, I, I hope people out there that are worrying about COVID sleep a little better knowing there is a whole slew of therapeutics for you. I mean, we, we absolutely don't have a cure. We're still in that stage where there's a lot of lot of investigation into just how the um, 
how the disease progresses, how it affects us, and that'll be in, in some of our topics later. Um, we obviously, the drugs are at different stages. I mean, the dexamethasone was an interesting one because, um, it, I mean, the, the trial in Europe really sort of indicated that it was only for moderate to severe cases and really had no effect in mild cases. Um, Rindesivir, uh, I mean, it's, it's obviously approved, but we're, we're still looking for other therapeutics that can combine with it to, to help further its um, its effect. And then the, the Regeneron uh, antibody cocktail is obviously still in development. So it, it seems to be effective, but we honestly don't know because it's still in phase three trials. So, it, I mean, obviously an interesting cocktail he took. I mean, we'll we'll hopefully see more therapies come through, but yeah, we we have to really emphasise there is no cure yet. Um, so we're still, as we do every week, say keep your masks on, maintain social distance, and based on our conversation last week, avoid crowded places with poor ventilation. Yeah, for sure. No, but it was uh, it's an interesting. What, what what just struck me right now is uh, I wonder how many people are taking. Remember, we we saw some stats. I think it was a quite a bit ago, maybe two or three months ago, it was only like 1% were on dexamethasone and 1% were on um, remdesivir. And it was still like the standard of care was still like, you know, some sort of antibiotic, which was really weird, right? So I wonder if we could dig up maybe for next week, what percentages treatments are, maybe something, a little homework for us, John. I think the issues, I think for to some extent for remdesivir has been the supply chain, which I, I, again, I know Gilead are working to resolve that, but I think that has limited some of its use. Yeah, it, it'd be interesting to dig into that, definitely. Well, uh, very cool. Uh, happy our president, whether you don't have to be political, we always want to see our president healthy. So, uh, John, the next uh, um, topic related to COVID. You found this one. This is on stopping COVID-19 by targeting out-of-control immune cells. Tell us a little bit about this uh, interesting so article. So there's a couple of couple of groups, one at Johns Hopkins and, in, and one at Imperial College London, looking at some of the different mechanisms whereby um, COVID attacks the body, particularly in, in this um, where we've seen the, the cascade of, of the body attacking itself. Um, and the Johns Hopkins team focus on factor H and factor D, which are uh, the complement. Um, it, it's, co- it's a complement pathway, which, I mean, I'll let you talk further on that. Um, but it's basically their take is that the, the COVID-19 spike proteins cause factor D to overstimulate the immune system, which prevents factor H from mediating response, which is how you have this cytokine, cytokine cascade, um, which the body ends, turns on itself and attacks itself. Um, I, I think the... It, it was interested, talks about the spike protein attaches to heparin on the surface of cells, and that prevents factor H from attaching, leaving those cells vulnerable to attack. And, and these are cells in the lung, blood vessels, and, and organ muscles. Yeah, John, so I'll, I'll touch on, like, there are three main pathways for complement. You got what's called the um, classical uh, pathway, the alternative pathway, which is weird because it's the more major. It was discovered second. That's why it's called alternative. And then there's the man and binding lectin, MBL, it's called. So there's three main pathways. These proteins, complement proteins, are not necessarily involved in them. They're more upstream. So typically, you know, your body's constantly coming in and um, sampling the environment, coming in contact with antigen. And so factor H and D, things are depositing on your cells. And, and then something will pop it off. I think it's factor D pops it off, or I can't quite recall. But if it starts to litter it and nothing's there to pop it off, that's when, or it's overproduced, that's when a cell will get targeted by the complement system. So it sort of starts it. And so what they're doing here is when you're overwhelmed, they're just, you know, sat, kind of sopping it up and removing it. Well, obviously that'll pr- stop the um, innate immune system and thereby sort of abate the uh, response to COVID. I hope that kind of made sense. I um, with what I just said there, John. So really cool stuff and uh, hats off to Hopkins and um, so, so the European counterpart. Yeah, the Imperial College London is actually looking at a different protein called FOXP3. Oh. It plays the role in mediating inflammatory immune response. And they, they looked at a small batch of, of lung samples, um, but looking at seriously ill patients versus not so ill. And the seriously ill patients were filled with hyperactive T cells um, and 
and th- their their theory is that it's it's the breaking mechanism and immune response, which is usually initiated by Fox P three, is being is failed, it's been disrupted, and that's where the um where the COVID is, is affecting affecting the lungs. Yeah, no, and the so the Fox P three is uh, a different. Um, it's actually an intranuclear um, protein that is part of um, a hallmark for regulatory T cells. So we actually have flow cytometry panels that measure FOXP3, and it's a marker of T regulatory cells. So what they're saying here is the lack of that regulation causes um, you know, perturbation of the immune system, and then the um, inflammatory immune response can't be stopped. So what they're doing here is um, you know, ensuring that you've got good regulation. You know, obviously, if you're missing the break, you can't stop it, and the, the FOXP3 um, positive cells are known to be regulatory cells and they're pumping the brakes on the immune response. Because without going into a whole immunology lecture here, John, um, but immunology is a fine line, right? It's a real dual-edged sword in terms of getting the immune system on, getting it targeted, and then turning it off. And it's amazing how much redundancy there is and it's amazing how um, how fine a line it is between normal health and you know being uh, sick. So really cool stuff. And uh, you know, nice to know that our Fox P3 panels are available for those that wish to study regulatory T cells. So, the, so they could be could be used for that in the future, at least in, in terms of uh, investigating COVID therapeutics. Yeah, I mean, like I say, it is all part of how much there's still so much focus on understanding the disease, and and then as a as a result of that, how we can then develop therapies to address these pathways. So yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a it was a nice find. Yeah, uh, and, and so John, I'll add. One, sorry, John. One, sorry, talking Go ahead. One, one thing to add is. Um, T regulatory cells are great. I wonder if the T helper 17 pathway will be evolved. That's another one that play, it, it has some duality to it. Sometimes it can help abate the immune response and sometimes it can go haywire. So that hasn't been talked about much because the T helper 17 pathway has probably evolved in the last, say, 10 or 15 years. Like when I went to graduate school, they, they didn't even have that pathway yet. So it was discovered over the last few years. And I feel like that is probably the next I, I would be... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see that pop up on the radar map in terms of a target as well. Sorry to. So to we'll keep scouring the literature, looking out for that. Obviously, we'll we'll keep watching this. Um, <clears throat> moving on, um, we, there's obviously been discussion throughout the this pandemic about if you're infected, does it confer immunity, or or do you have to be concerned about that? And there's actually a news agency based in the Netherlands has has. Uh, initiated a, a reinfection tracker um, where they've been watching the number of cases come through. And it's a very, very small number of people who have been reinfected. But the why it was in the news this week, we actually had the first patient who has actually died after being reinfected from, from COVID. So it was a 18, 89-year-old woman in the Netherlands who who was, um, her system was fairly compromised because she had some severe underlying illnesses. But she had um, obviously one Form of the the virus recovered from that, um, but sadly got infected with a different strain and 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 obviously couldn't couldn't fight it off. So she's the first case where where this has happened. Like I said, the, the number of cases is low. It's, I mean, the, this this tracker from BNO shows twenty three cases in Hong Kong, Belgium, Qatar, the Netherlands, United States, Ecuador, and India. So I, I mean, I, it's obviously an incomplete data set, but still, uh, even if based on the number of cases in those countries it's a it's a very low percentage yeah john i think this is a case of um i feel like covid is still the current uh sars covid 2 is quite um virulent i think herd immunity hasn't kicked in and as we've said before you just it's not like a you know a chicken pox party where you can come out and just everybody gets it no you do not want this um certainly it's uh i don't know if troubling is the right word but there's this thought if you were infected you'd have some immunity we're not there yet. I think all of us should really stay, you know, as we mentioned, just keep uh, going with the guidelines and uh, let's hope over time we see uh, improvement here. Or at least, again, I think there will be a natural progression um, that will, you know, as humans will evolve and um, have some herd immunity, but we're years away from that along with the vaccine. So don't go out of your way to get it and uh, don't be a fool when it comes to, you know, kind of all hanging out and just get it and then we'll be cured, right? 
Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's it's this the herd immunity has come up for discussion again this week, and uh, I mean the, the the articles I've read you're, you're right it emphasizes how far we are away from oh, that. Oh yeah. So really, it's our 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 own personal behaviour is our is our best protection against the virus at I the mean, moment. Eventually, you'll well, just like what happens with the flu, there'll be passive immunity as part of it too. So not only will you be giving someone COVID, you're giving them your antibodies. That's we're way we're years away from that. So that but that's part of what happens when you're if you are in contact, people you can, you know, it's not um but anyhow, let's maybe let's move on to the next topic, John, because I think I could uh sit here and uh contemplate the evolution of COVID for uh quite a long time. So um the next story here is about Regeneron, right? Um they say uh the former uh, FDA chief, uh, Global, uh, Global Scott, Scott, Scott Gottlieb, uh, uh, Scott Scott Gottlieb is, is the name. Gottlieb. I believe I met him, actually. I think he was at a WRIB one year. Anyhow, um, chief says U.S. too late on mass manufacturing of COVID-19 antibodies, which was somewhat interesting. Um, I don't know uh, how I feel about him making this sort of statement around it being too late, but uh, we've always talked about supply chain issues and how the demand is there and, um, you know, that capacity being saturated, right? I, th- I think the, I think the point he's trying to make is, um, you know, it's, it's the, the, the drug is still, you know, you know Re- Regenerative applied for emergency use authorization for this, for this antibody combo, but the number of doses they have available, it's not, it, it can't be rolled out across the board to everyone. Um, I mean, he, he sort of stated to meet the winter demand, we should have between three and 400,000 doses, whereas Regeneron currently have about 50,000 doses available. I mean, they are looking to partner to, to increase production. So Roche, the partner with Hoffman LaRoche, who have set aside a thousand 100,000 litres of bioreactor capacity to help gear up production. But there's obviously a time frame attached to that, which then says, you know, given your, if your demand really is those 300 to 400,000 doses of winter, in winter, how how quickly can you get to them when you know that, that your capacity is still gearing up to to meet that demand? I think that's where he was coming from as much as much as anything else. Yeah, and, and I think the difference here is, you know, a traditional vaccine, um, is made in like eggs and, and they take a, quite a bit of uh, time. I think it's upwards of six to nine months. I can't quite recall. Manufacturing large size liters of monoclonal antibodies is still time consuming. I, I, I don't know the exact time frame, but we frequently um, make, make monoclonal antibodies or at least subcontract to make it. We don't actually do it, but we work with a couple different groups that do, and that can take three to six months. Um, but I'm sure they could keep it down to the three month. But to your point, it's really midwinter when anything would be ready and maybe i don't want to say too late but you know any, as soon as we can get it the better right yeah absolutely it, it's really illustrating we're not ready to go on this there's a time lag that we have that is being addressed you know yeah um but still um interesting to- it, it, it's actually an interesting story and one we certainly wanted to touch on around you know hey it's uh, great that we saw some benefit from it with uh, the president, but uh, temper expectations upon being able to get it at your local Walgreens. <laughs> yeah. so supply chain is going to be an issue on on this for for a while, I'm sure, particularly yeah. with all these medications. So but, if we if we move on, still talking on COVID, but now we're now moving on to vaccines. Um, it was actually we we still got AstraZeneca's vaccine is on hold in the US, although it's moving forward in other countries. But jo- Johnson and Johnson have actually halted all of its COVID nineteen vaccine studies because it's had an unexplained illness in one study. Um, they, they haven't released any details of what ails the patient. They want to keep that confidentiality um, but in, certainly in the wider medical community there's concern about whether this is use due to use of the adenovirus vector this is also the vector that's used for the AstraZeneca vaccine and these are the only two that we've seen these adverse events for um, so no so it was in looking at the article. It, was, it said no, no approved vaccine uses the adenovirus approach, and it's, they, we've never had a vaccine using that approach tested on the scale. Although at the counter to that is the same vectors actually being used in both China and Russia on in the vaccines that they've 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 actually um, 
made available to larger groups of people. Like I know the Chinese made it available for the military, um, but they haven't shared any safety data. So we don't yeah. actually know what the, the Chinese and Russian vaccines take in this approach, if they've seen any issues or not. So, I, I mean, and the other part of this is, this is typical of a phase three trial. You know, you're going to see these incidents and you want to be sure that the drug companies take them seriously, investigate them, and then then make the appropriate decision whether they proceed with development or if they halt. And, and it is part and parcel of the drug development process. Yeah, John, we, I think it's important that this is being publicized. Like, it would be shocking if we didn't have any of this. We, As you mentioned, China and Russia, they're not seeing, you know, you don't hear anything about that. That's that's troublesome, right, John? Is exactly. If you, if, you, if, you, if you intimately understand vaccines or even drug development, you know that these types of, you know, self-imposed halting are really important things to do. They're, they're, um, they kind of, sometimes they can be slanted in a somewhat negative light, but the reality is this happens quite frequently and um, I don't think anybody should look at it as um, a major setback or, you know, uh, scrapping the program because of some safety issues around a brand new vaccine. Uh, so, uh, you know, John, I think there's one, uh, maybe we'll touch on one, the other uh, uh, large pharma that was J&J, that their trial uh, got stopped as well. Um, why don't you share with us a little bit about that trial? So the the final one is, or the again, this was in the news the last couple of days. Very little information on this one, but it's actually Eli Lilly who had an antibody drug that was. They are also going for um, emergency use authorization, similar to Regeneron. Um, Eli Lilly's is a single antibody. Regeneron's is a cocktail, um, and this is it's it's a. So it's actually the NIH placed a, the, one of their trails on hold, but they haven't given any reason for the hold. Um, and we haven't heard either from Lilly or NIAID on this, except the only reason I've mentioned, uh, the only reason I've seen mentioned is they're doing it due to an abundance of caution. <laughs> And that's it. So we don't. I mean, with the vaccine trials, you, you, we at least have said there's a single patient of has had this, you know, result. We we don't know what's what's going on with the 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 Lilly antibody. So we're waiting to to um see if see if more details emerge on that. So yeah, it's, this one's a little. It's not again surprising, but it's a little bit more um um perplexing seeing how it's a it's an antibody usually you don't see as much and as you said they've been kind of they talk about being a manufacturing failure inspection or something so maybe it's not even related to actual so, adverse so, events right and then so, that, so that, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll respond on that um but, but i think there was two two things on this one the trial was put on hold but also as an fda inspection of um of one of their their facilities producing this and they they found some issues in terms of record keeping and things like that so it's it's as, as one of the articles did is a one to hit on this this drugs development and ob obviously we'll see more as you know as the story progresses but um <laughs> certainly um yes it, um, it's where Lily were thinking things were looking great a week ago. They're not looking so great now for the yeah. moment. So. I would hate to be working at that CMO or CDMO <laughs> where that happened at right now. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of restless nights at that CRO. Um, no. And, and one thing to touch on with the Lily vaccine is it comes with remdesivir. So I thought that was interesting. They're co co-dosing. Um, sure. So really cool. Uh, so, you know, somewhat of a little bit of a setback for both J&J &J and Eli Lilly. However, I, I feel like these things will rebound quite quite quickly and, and be back and, on track. And Lilly do have another drug where a, a, it's their anti-inflammatory that they're they're investigating for for administration with um, remdesivir. And that, I think, is, is that Jacalfi, I think, is its um, approved name? Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, and th that they're looking for emergency youth authorization on that. So again, th there's some they've seen some favorable data that might suggest it as application. So yeah, and Lily's been very active in the news. They had a big quarter, but let's uh, that was a that didn't make our news, John. So <laughs> let's uh, let's transition because we're uh, running long. But it's been it's it's still important to go over all of this. I think there's quite a bit of COVID, so I hope we touched on everything. The last. Um, well, not the last. That we're going to move on to our um, non-COVID news, and this is one you 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 dug up. It's a company called Mellencrop 
uh, they're a generics company and they're filing for bankruptcy due to the opiate litigation. So tell us a little bit more about that one, John. So yeah, Malincrot, um, uh, were of the, the third company to, to take this route after Purdue Pharma and Insys Therapeutics. Um, they, they were actually, I think Malincrot had the big highest revenues from from sales of opioids etc but more recently they they they're dealing with hundreds of lawsuits and obviously are pay, paying out hundreds of millions um from critics point of view they're they're seeing this as uh a, a increasingly common tactic amongst these companies so they're 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 using it as a pathway to freeze litigation and then leave litigants competing for payouts with the company's creditors. Um, Malin Crotts say they plan to continue with the tentative settlement reached earlier this year, which was around $1.6 billion to resolve claims over Malin Crotts' role in the opioid crisis. So, I mean, they are, they are intending to, to continue. Um, they, they, their focus is on developing new compounds post, post-bankruptcy, um, but the, the, their pipeline, f- based on one article, um, may not be that great. The, the, their lead compound was rejected for the second time recently over concerns over safety and e- efficacy. But yeah, I mean, we we obviously Purdue Pharma in the news a lot over over their role in the 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 fa- the controlling family, you know, trying to protect themselves from litigation, etc. So, um, the the, the you know, there's there's going to be um, obviously the, the the opioid crisis uh, and the, the, these companies' practices fueling that. You know, has to has to be resolved. Yeah, no, there. I, I think you you know Purdue was dominating. I, I didn't even realize that Mellencroft uh, actually had more sales. And but unlike Purdue, this is interesting. They're not. Uh, you know, Purdue's trying to reemerge post bankruptcy, but um, Mellencroft is um, looking to continue to operate during this uh, time. And I don't know, John, if you've ever seen the massive building, I think it's in downtown DC area. Um, they have a big site there. Um, that's, you know, you can, it's one of those, they have it on the building and everything. Do you know what I'm talking about at all? Have you ever seen I, it? I there? haven't seen it. No, yeah. no, I, no, I don't know if it's in DC, but it's in that area. And like, you know, there's so many little pockets of um, kind of urban setting down there, but I wonder how long that'll stay up. So, um, <laughs> John, let's quickly do some um, drug approvals for uh, September, right? Um, so, yeah. So September was a, was a relatively quiet month. Um, t- two drugs approved in the in the month, but they were right at the beginning of the beginning of September. And actually, we haven't seen an approval between the beginning of September and until yesterday. So it's like that that frantic pace that we saw at the beginning of the year has slowed up recently um total approvals year to date is 40 and we're still on pace to hit 53 for the year which would still be a very good year in terms of, of drug approvals um the, the the one approval in october will be a really fascinating one to talk about i'm not going to talk about it now but that that is a it, if you if you look in the literature i i it, it's an interesting one um however just two here both in oncology one's um a, a radioactive diagnostic agent um, indicate t- looking just for tumors in adult patients, um, and the other is proseltinib, which is Genentech drug um, for treatment of um, non-small cell lung cancer. So yeah, you've quite month approval wise, but as we know, the, there'll be we we see months like this, others will pop up, but mm-hmm. it's certainly a quiet time yeah. at the moment. I- we hope it's not a slowdown due to COVID, uh, but we, it could be. But we'll fi- we'll see as we um, move on and progress throughout the year. Meaning, this is. Um, but you're right; it's not it's not unheard of to have just a couple approvals in a month. So I'm I'm not going down that path. I believe our industry is as robust and healthy as it's ever been. So yeah, absolutely. No, I mean forty today is 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 a good yeah. it's a good number. That forty today is more than many years we've seen in the full yeah. year. So yeah, in terms of a year for drug approvals, it's been a good year so far. Well John, that'll kind of wrap up the news. Let's uh which was really uh quite a quite a lot. Very exciting stuff going on and we're gonna go on to our main topic here. Uh this is our non-GLP, non-clinical drug development, part two of three. We're going to go uh, look at discovery um, services, uh, both LCMS and what we call a universal assay on the LBA side. 
Um, this is an exciting podcast number 24 topic, John. And uh, let's just dive right into the, why don't you go ahead and uh, start defining how you uh, want to, when we talk about discovery LCMS in a non-clinical, non-GLP setting, what exactly do we mean there? And then I'll so, on the UAV. So as, as bioanalytical people, um, discovery is a really convenient catch-all term, but it covers an, a wide gamut of, of different activities, many of which we don't support. But within our LCMS group, um, it cover, so really what we're, as a, as a basis, that we're talking uh, non, when we say non-regulated, this is non-GLP studies. These are really early studies looking at potential drug candidates to then move into the full development pipeline. But is a, this the, the the drug development pipeline is like a we're, we're sort of feeding the funnel in terms of we have a large number of compounds at, pre-discovery and we're trying to figure out whether the properties of those compounds make them desirable to then move through early non non regulate these non regulated so what we're called non GLP doing early studies where we we do small animal studies regulating like PK profile, so pharmacokinetic profile, does the drug behave in a in an animal model like we want it to for an expected indication. Um, knowing having tested things like receptor, you know what 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 sites does it attack, things like that. So this is from a small molecule basis. Um, you know, the other activities again that are outside of us, we'll look at solubility, metabolism, um, various activities that like will be under the the discovery umbrella. But even with an LCMS, um, we we in common with other um, groups will grade our what we call discovery assays that are really non G, non GLP non clinical assays. Um, we'll we'll have very basic um, assays which have wide acceptance criteria. So you're really just doing a, a quick and dirty assay. Quick and dirty meaning we don't put a lot of time into developing it. We're not really trying to make, to run it. So it, it's it's a really optimal assay. So if there are minor issues, it it's not enough to affect the conclusions we draw from the study. As you as you you whittle down the number of candidates you're looking at, the 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 level of the assay may require slightly tighter criteria, um, such that by the time you're moving into the regulated GLP type assays you actually have a much better handle on how those compounds behave but you if for example if you're looking at a class of compounds you may have started with tens of compounds but you get to one that actually then goes into the deregulated GLP development um, yeah. case. John I think it's important that last piece you said around you know we're not we don't we don't help with thousands of compounds that you need to screen we help with as you mentioned as you start to get further along that into that 10 right or maybe it's three or four at a time some lead candidates that you want to do some sure. quick and dirty dirty studies on and so on the, on the um lba side or the biopharma side or the biologics large molecule side um i don't you know none of us like the term quick and dirty but what we have is um something called a universal assay for uh, discovery. So um, groups will have antibodies or at least, so there's huge libraries of uh, antibodies out there, but uh, groups will start to whittle down their antibody selection towards what their target is, right? So they'll have, say somebody wants to go after receptor X, but they'll make three or four different antibodies that go after receptor X. And that's when they'll start to use this universal assay. And what it is, is in any non-human uh, matrix, you take advantage of a humanized monoclonal antibody because um, the humanized monoclonal antibody dosed into any animal is going to be in the sea of their antibody can stand out. So we just, all it is, is, is it's actually just an anti, it's a method to go and detect human antibodies. And we call it a universal assay because it can detect any humanized monoclonal antibody in, in just about any non-human matrix. So it can be, you know, whether it's mice or, um, rats or um, sinos or dogs or whatever it might be, you can take advantage of the human antibody in the sea of the species antibody. So I hope that's kind of clear how we're describing it. And then, you know, to take it a step further, some human, all humanized antibodies are some sort of subtype. So we have methods for IgG1s, for IgG4s. Those are the predominant two that um, people make uh, humanized 
monoclonal antibodies are. There are IgG2 and 3, but people, uh, for whatever reasons, a variety of reasons, tend not to use those immunoglobulin types. So, you know, John, we got good compliment on both sides of our service lines here in terms of uh, drug discovery. Really cool stuff, stuff that we do quite a bit of. We've seen a large uptick on both sides recently. And um, so that's uh, pretty good. And, you know, any last thoughts on just the discovery role itself before we kind of dive into the next uh, topic on our agenda? Yeah, I, I, th I think it's interesting to talk about the upstream from us where, where we, you said about the thousands of compounds and and that's where we're not involved. Really, that that a lot of that is in the where where people are, are screening large numbers of compounds at a time and it may purely just be down to physical characteristics of how easy is it to to dissolve those compounds to make a dosing solution. Um, so the, that... We we might touch on that piece by the time they finally they whittled it down, but a lot of the screening really is just investigating the physical characteristics to 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 determine do they have something that that might be admin administrable to a to a a test system. So it, it touches on where we were with Alf last week, talking about you know the animal stuff and and that's some that's some of the the work that they'll do in terms of looking at those early compounds. Then can they get them into animals to then go further? And that's part part of the partnering that they do with 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 pharma companies. Yeah, no, I think you said it nice. It's uh, it, we really are picking up from where Alf uh, from attentive last week, and um, you're right. We're on on the biologic side. It's uh, slightly, you know, you, you, it's a little bit different because, as I mentioned, they. And by the way, it's not all biologics. I'm being very specific to just monoclonal antibodies. Um, again, people have huge libraries, um, big business, lots of different ways to make a monoclonal. Their their struggle is to figure out what targets they want to go after. And a lot of clients that we talk to, there, some are really spread out too much, and others are pretty focused. I would always try to keep it limited. Uh, to a couple and not uh, diversify too much. But anyhow, John, that that's a um, good job there. And tying uh, it back into part one of our series of three. And, and um, another, key, another key piece of this non-regulated um, bioanalytical is a lot, we may do quite a bit of tissue work where we're looking at where the, where the drug goes in, in animal species and, you know, particularly like ocular stuff, you're going to get tissues that you wouldn't get from a, a clinical trial. So you really want to be sure that the drug is going where it needs to, for example, in the eye and things like that. So it's not just plasma and urine. It's, it, it can be a lot more complex in terms of the, the, the matrices that we're working with. Yeah, no, um, good points there. Definitely. Um, Maybe even a topic is PK in tissue, as there's still a lot of uh, challenges making it regulated, John, is where I was going there. But uh, yeah, you. you're absolutely right. There's uh, definitely um, a need to look at uh, multiple matrices uh, during the discovery stage. Um, yeah, so, so John, let's... Uh, and actually, before we move on, John, I think one thing I on our side, or, or sorry, I say our side, but for the universal assay, there's a couple ways we manage calibrators in... Uh, what I call calibrators, so standards and QCs. So um, there are times when, um, and, and it's like an iterative approach. As as a as a company makes say three MABs, we do more. We do we take a couple of days more development up front, and we can either do three standards and three QCs, or sometimes it works out where we can get away with just one um, standards. But we typically have matrix QCs for all three. And they're, they're quick and dirty, as you state. They're not highly, they don't need to be highly precise. They don't have to have large, uh, you know, really low levels of sensitivity. But I hope that made sense. Sometimes we can get away with three, you know, in this case, just using three as an example. But then as they make more of them, if they're using the same platform, we could just plug and play. We just, we don't have to do any development. They just send their next salvo and it tends to work. We vetted out the capture antibody and detecting antibody. Um, that's sort of what we're looking at on our end. And and I, I know a little bit about the LCMS side, but I'll let you tell us how you manage standards and QCs. So, yeah. So st again, uh, well, we, we, there's, there's, there's multiple approaches. I mean, again, I talked on the different research, the different level of assays and really that the, the main differentiator is purely on the, um, the acceptance criteria. Well, for the, the very, 
I don't want to call it quick and dirty, but for the less rigorous assay, we have wider acceptance criteria on precision and accuracy, such that um, if we're talking a fully GLP assay, we'd be talking 15%. We'd, if something's outside 15% or 20% at the lower limit of quantitation, that we're going to have to look at, it may lead to run um, disqualification once you assess all the data, or in the case of a standard, you'd have to reject it. With the um, this, the non-regulated, non-GLP assays, um, those, those criteria are wider. Um, also, other practices that we do, um, we can we can run a long a, 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 a calibration curve that runs over several orders of magnitude, and then just we just not use the standards that aren't appropriate to your to your samples if you see that the the calibration curve departs from linear and starts going quadratic we can drop those those high end um standards so you're 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 trying to run things as efficiently as possible just to get a result that and and, and some of this is is comparative you know if you're looking at multiple compounds it's not the absolute values of those com of those from the blood samples is important is actually the trend and the pk behavior that that's important between those different compounds to then figure out which is the one that goes into the the next step into you know a, a next step into development so it it does there's a lot of where where G, a regulate to GLP assay will be a defined calibration curve. If something's above the curve, you 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 reassay that sample with dilution and a subsequent run. Uh, no, the non-regulated, non-GLP, you, you have tricks where you don't don't need to do that. So, John, do you um, and you know I think we got to move on a little bit, but is do you always have a standard curve? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely, we do. Um, for so the good. for the very early for very early, um, we may not run with QCs, so we may not have QC samples for a very uh, simple basic assay. We might just run a curve, and that's it. Okay, got we it. Actually, so that was what I actually, was. We may actually vary the number of calibration standards as well. So I know that. I mean, I think. Seriously, we tend to stick with around five, at least five. Uh, for a lot of our um, regulated GLP assays, will be eight to ten calibration points. But with, there's there's been debate in the um, in the industry. I, I mean, I've worked with other groups in the past where they've done three point calibration curves and things like that. So I mean, it a lot of it is is coming up with an assay that meets your needs depending on the the point of development for those for the for a particular compound knowing that actually one single study may be enough to tell you whether you want to take that compound any further or not or just dump it yeah. so it's, it's that kind of thing uh, john i think it's almost like a context of use for pk and we're yeah. not going down that path today so no very good stuff there john um maybe i think we the next uh, item on our list here is the roles uh the role of uh this in drug development i think we're we're kind of talking about that as we um, sort of shared how we're not at the thousand level, we screen a few, but I, I think what, what was intended here is this is really the first salvo towards drug development, right? So I think, and I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and what what I think people are doing in the bioanalysis world, and it's great, it, it's been, a it's, for me, it's been revolutionary on the biopharma side over the last few years. People are finally starting to get that like, Bioanalysis is not like a, oh, uh, 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 an afterthought. So what I mean by that is they're engaging much earlier in the drug development process, and that's at the CMO, CDMO level. So I think if you're out there doing drug development and you start making non-GLP lots of your material, you really have to have a bioanalysis plan. And the first step is this discovery that we're talking about, John, right? Would you agree? I think there's been a huge shift where in the past people would come and say, oh, hey, but, but at least on the biopharmaceutical side, maybe not so much on the small molecule side, they'd be like, oh yeah, by the way, what's this immunogenicity? And well, you know, I think we need PK as well. So just a little bit of um, some things that I talk about that <laughs> is kind of nerdy, right? <laughs> I, think, I think that might be more more applicable to 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 the large molecule than the small but i do think i think we we do see in some cases that for example biomarkers 
we're 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 look, we're being asked to look at those earlier than we we necessarily did before. Yeah, and I, I think and it's due to. Oh, sorry, John, go ahead. No, no, I think that was it. That was all I was going to say. Yeah, and I think really it's due to how much more mature the um, small molecule pharma space is sure. relative to the biopharma space. I think there are quite a few people, and and, and that kind of has faded a little bit, but they've inherited biologics. Now all your big players have both, right? There's not many that are like, oh, we acquired this for the first time. Those That was more five years ago. I think most uh, people in the drug business have um, branched out into biopharmaceuticals, but they're still learning that the bioanalysis is a little bit... Um, you know, earlier is good and that's, you know, kind of intrinsic, but there's just a couple more things to look at. You mentioned the biomarker. We also have that immunogenicity component that becomes into play here. And now we are doing more. They're not necessarily universal ADA assays, um, but we are looking at ways to do, you know, quick and dirty ADA. And, you know, we, I don't like that word, but it's applicable at times. Yeah, I think I think the the education for us as bioanalytical people, certainly in the LCMS realm, was learning that the the methods that you develop for non regulated non GLP assays don't have to be perfect, and that you know the the, the, the we I certainly in the past life have seen people really struggle with that where they're used to developing an assay that has to has to be you know give you precise and accurate results, but this, as we mentioned multiple times today discovery doesn't necessarily need that and that is something that is it can be a learning curve for people yeah john i think you did a nice job of segueing into our third topic right like how can a how a cro can make or break your discovery or what we'll call our universal assay program so that's a nice segue into it meaning if you try to build the taj mahal you can really slow down and cost money for people right so yeah. that that's exactly what you're driving at you it, it's really about getting the answer, getting the right answer, getting it reproducible and moving on. It does not have to be this, and our, and our, you know, you don't need to really d dive into the range of quantitation. I mean, you obviously want to know some matrix effect. You want to look at some dilution linearity, but things like specificity and selectivity. And as you said, you can, if, if it's okay to have a 30% CV in our world, you talked about 15 and 20, that's like GLP level for us, but you can have larger percentages, maybe even a little bit above 30. So long as that PK profile looks okay, move on, right? Like as long yeah. as it's giving you the data you need and, you know, it's making sense, then, then don't try to uh, tweak it too much. And so that yeah. really, as we've done, um, Man, we've done probably six, I think it's almost seven different clients and probably a good 30 different MABs. We've gotten a lot better on our side, and I'm sure you can make the case on the discovery side as well. It, it, it's, it's absolutely the key is providing an assay that gives an, uh, an answer that is good enough for the development scientists to, to then move on to the next step, that they can interpret the data but you, and and because developing an asset is good enough that you can deliver quickly to give them that answer is is the key. That's what discovery is all about. It or non regulated non GLP bioanalysis. That's what it's all about. It is how quickly can we get you the answer that helps you move forward yeah. in your process and 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 discovery. This this non GLP piece is is all about rapidity. Uh, you're right, John. Similar. Uh, to further hammer home the role of the CRO, um, if you the other part is, I think it's important to ensure that the CRO you're using for this still has a GLP GCP quality about them, which is important for us to touch on. All of our instrumentation in our non-regulated, non-clinical space is still done on GLP instruments, right? We there's and it's still done in a GLP fashion, and that's the quality of the data that becomes important because if you're, you know, and I, I don't want to like back all in lives that are, you know, some of the in lives will do some non-regulated work and some of them do it very well, but others can trip you up if they're, if the quality's not there, John, you still got to make sure that quality's high in the method, even if it's quick and dirty. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the important thing for, uh, for, for us as bio, bio, bioanalytical people is the record keeping is there such that, you know, you're, you're very unlikely to be asked to reconstruct the, uh, the, the data by, you know, a regulatory review. That's not going to happen, but you still want to have the meticulous record keeping such that if you are asked questions about what was done, you can then revisit it and say, here's exactly what was done. Yeah. Because, because 
we are looking at it from a bioanalytical perspective. You, if, if you're working with the customer, they something about the data may prompt certain questions from them. So if they come back with a question, you still need to have the, that record Correct. keeping. I mean, for, so for much of this, I mean, we, we, yeah, you're right. We, we, we're using the same instrumentation that is all, all obviously um, maintained to a, a specific schedule. Um, it's all qualified before use. Um, really, the record keeping is consistent with what we do in, in the, in the GLP environment. The, for much of this, the only change is we don't have um, involvement with the, the QA group because they don't need to be involved in that. But it still gets 100% QC. Um, I know uh, even still for uh, the biopharmaceutical side, we still put them into Watson limbs. Um, sometimes on the discovery side, I don't know if everything goes through Watson limbs on your side, but certainly for us, um, it still goes in. So what I'm driving at is, it, like you said, it, it, it's not just the moment, right? If someone has to try to trace your steps from a year ago, you better have a quality lab that documented, for instance, if the asset gets sold, right? It, these are investments that people are making. So you don't have to recreate the wheel if you've done a good job in your non-regulated, excuse me, the non-GLP, non-clinical space for drug discovery. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you hundred percent on that. Well, John, um, any uh, last thoughts as we wrap up podcast number 24 and it's part two of three on our Non GLP, non clinical series. No, I, I think I think this, like you said, this was a good discussion. I wasn't quite sure where we we're going to go with this one, but I, I think from my perspective, it was it was valuable and, and interesting, and hopefully people find it. That I way learned too. a lot, John. I certainly learned a lot about um, our um, um, discovery LCMS and what we do on your side. For instance, I didn't realize we always had standards. I was under the impression sometimes we didn't, but I guess I was misinformed there. So really great topic, John. I hope you learned a little bit about universal assays and immunoglobulins and what it all means. Uh, and some of our standards are better than others, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, uh, let's see if we've got any feedback this week. Uh, we do not, um, unless you guys have some that you know of. Nope. Nope. Yeah, no, uh, I, that's okay, John. I'm not going to, my, our feelings aren't going to be hurt that we didn't get any feedback this week. So, um, John, it looks like we don't have any feedback or questions from our audience, but we encourage all of you to get on social media, share your thoughts with you. We are always looking to grow and get better on this podcast. Well, John, uh, what, what plans you got this uh, weekend and uh, as we're rounding into the middle of fall during a pandemic? So I'm trying to ignore all the leaves on the ground and I'll avoid doing anything in terms of raking those up. Um, in terms of plans this week, not much this weekend. Next weekend's a big week for us. Actually, I was hoping if things, all things being equal, I'd hope not to even be here this, this week. Um, my, my nephew it was supposed to be getting married on, on Saturday in London. And um, when we talked about it, you know, earlier in the year, it looked like it was going to be a really nice venue and the reception was going to be spectacular. And it was a chance for, you know, the entire family to go over and spend a few days in London. And, uh, and COVID has put paid to that. In actual fact, the, the wedding itself is, has gone back for at least a week because um, his fiance's father tested positive earlier this week. So right now, I'm not sure even when it's going to happen, despite me not being able to go to it. Yeah, that that's, um, you know, really probably the biggest drawback there is some of what you touched on, a lot of things around not being able to go to cool places like London. I really enjoyed my one trip there. I did like it. And then also wreaking havoc on weddings and funerals and all sorts of things that are just, yeah. you know, people that can't see their newborns. And I think some of that's abated, but there's still a lot of, I've heard of people who haven't seen their grandparents in quite some time. So, um, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, that's how, that's how it is during this at this time. But yeah, So, so the, for them, the wedding party, I think was, you're allowed to have 15 people at the wedding um, in the in the UK, so they were struggling with numbers on figuring oh. out who who could and couldn't go. I mean, I actually, obviously, we we talked about this with with my my family, and I was a, a, a several months ago had lined up the restaurant that we were going to go and have a nice family meal at 
outside of the wedding as a, as a restaurant called Medlar in Kings Road in Chelsea, which is fantastic. Um, but sadly, we're not getting there anytime soon, even though it's now open again. Um, but yeah, it's it's sadly it's just so one of the things we have to deal with in with, on, on this current current environment. But yeah, yeah that, just a quiet weekend. Well, How about you? Meant, John, you mentioned my favorite football uh you know <laughs> football club there chelsea so actually the epl returns this weekend it was off last week and i'm excited to watch a little english premier league i definitely missed that early morning uh events those are fun to watch at 6 45 a.m my time and so uh, i'm excited to see that come back and really an exciting year there and you know i don't i, I don't have anything too exciting going on my wife's birthday is <clears throat> Monday, so I'll, I'll have to do some shopping she's given me a nice wish list she listens to the podcast so i am not going to um share what i'm getting for you honey but no it's always i have a lot of fun shopping for her and i know a lot of people don't like shopping i i don't mind it um i enjoy it she's easy to shop for other than that the weather's supposed to be real nice here i um might get out and bike a little bit i i i Treated myself uh, to a new set of golf clubs recently, so I've been going to the driving rain and and got doing a little. I golfed last weekend. You know, I took some time off, so that might be in my cards. Maybe I don't know if you know what Top Flight Golf is or anything like that, but those are cool places to go. And um, as it gets a little cooler, you can just, you know, it's like three stories high, and you can hit golf balls and try and hit the guy picking up the golf balls and have some food and beverage. Yeah, I've I've seen the place. Never never been to one at all. Yeah, that's fun. So that's and and golf is my new. Uh, I don't know. I, I I had golf maybe once a year and uh, hadn't golfed at all this year, but uh, seems to be uh, something that I'm starting to get into. Most notably because my son is. I think it's a good sure. activity for he and I to to do together. Had went one time with him too on a nice little par three walking with him and had a good time. Yeah, so. So I may have to find a few excuses to drive around just to just to make sure that this this oh. car works for me. Yeah, and and then uh, the other th- you know I got that deck um, uh, that's built. It's beautiful. It's got my grill on it. That's it. We we actually went and looked at some furniture um, to our chagrin. The place we really liked is uh, they won't have anything till March. Uh, so we we identified what we wanted, um, but. Um, you know, we're kind of torn if we want to wait six months before or well, whatever that. Yeah, Mark is six months away before we get it. So we we have uh, we might go out and look at you know, and that's a, a big purchase if if you know this is a the deck I have is good size, and so this is some you know eight or nine piece unit with a nice fire pit, a gas fire pit in the middle. It's beautiful. I can't wait, but we need some. Inter- we might get something interim. You know, kind of a little bit more affordable from like a Target or a Walmart or something, just so we have something to sit on because right now it's an empty deck. So is, is that supply issues? I, I think it is, yes. I mean, yeah, this is a, yeah. it's so a got- supply issue thing and it's a demand. I mean, yeah, the woman yeah. was like, everything's gone. Don't, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we we have, our, our, as I've mentioned before, we have an old house. Um, <clears throat> we had um, front door, had like a storm door outside it. Um, it few weeks ago the, the 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 glass panel of the storm door just fell out of it um so we took that door off and we just have the old front door which need replacing but my wife knows what she wants in terms of front door but again there's we can't find it anywhere <laughs> it's, yeah it's the same deal is like supply issues is everything like scarce first you know these are first world nation uh you know <laughs> developed nation uh worries we have john so yeah, there you go, that's yeah. our biggest yeah. worry we're doing all right right i gotta wait six exactly. months for my deck yes. furniture i'm doing well yeah yes no and then uh um you know on a t- switching gears a little bit my son is gonna go to school now it's a hybrid format but he starts monday so we're really excited about that we got some really good news they were going to hold the football players out He's got two more games, so he's going to miss the first like couple weeks. Wasn't going to be able to go and tour the school like he did last night. Him and mom went up there, and they because the school's kind of big, and so um, happy that we because that was a little bit of a you can imagine when ninety nine percent of the school's back, but the football players were the only people that weren't allowed. Um, he he was going to have some real challenges because they were going to stop zooming the classes and stuff. So. But that's all behind us. That caused a little bit of stress in my life. But it's still a little stressful to think he's going back. And, you know, I don't know how much you're paying attention to the college football and stuff, but, you know, the Florida LSU games canceled, massive outbreaks. Uh, Coach of Alabama got – I don't know. I I feel like 
I can't tell what's going to happen there, but uh, I think we just got to brace ourselves for a pretty massive wave. And, and, you know, hoping that people don't get hospitalized is, is never a good plan, John, right? Yeah, like, well, that's yeah. not a plan to say, oh, let's hope yeah. no one, because the hospitalizations are way down, but I don't know. Yeah. It's 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 a worry. I mean, it, looking at Europe, you, the, the Europe had think its highest highest rate of new cases in this last week than it's seen. Um, and then just briefly touching on on Hereford Conference North, there's been a number of postponements because of, of players in that league. Being, I mean, even though it's six levels down, testing positive for COVID, so there's called games off. So enough about our weekend. I know that Jeremy also has something he wants to mention about his plans for the weekend. Yeah, I don't often cut in here, but I uh, thought I'd uh, put it out there that by the time people are listening to this next week, uh, I will have exited my 30s and officially be a 40-year-old. So this Saturday, I'm celebrating the big 4-0, um, of course, because of COVID. Uh, my wife was disappointed that we, we wouldn't be able to have as big a party as she'd been kind of hoping for, almost like two or three years uh, looking forward to our 40th because um, our birthdays are pretty close together. Uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm going over the hill this weekend. So by the time uh, listeners are hearing this, uh, this podcast, uh, I will be 40. Well, happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And welcome to the club. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm a couple years away from 50, but uh, yeah. I remember my four. I actually, I don't remember my 40th, but my wife threw a nice um, little party for me and, uh, you know, had a good 20, 25 people. We rented out a nice little, she rented out a hall for me or a section of a, a, a of a nice pool hall restaurant type place. And we had a good time. So, but my, well, yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah I, 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 I can get away with saying this because I know that she doesn't listen to this podcast as often, but um, uh, I actually do have something big planned for her birthday, which is only a week or so after mine. So I'm not too worried that we're going to be keeping it low key this weekend. And I'm actually just looking forward to kind of drifting into my uh, my 40s with a, a beer on in my hand uh, on the back deck and relaxing. So it should be nice. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I'm going to talk any further about age. Um, I'm way, way older than both of you. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I think we should probably call it quits for this week. Yeah, you bet, John. Before we do that, we're just going to uh, share with you what next week topic is going to be and what a historic week it is for us here, right, John? It's our podcast number 25, which is our sur- silver anniversary, and you'll just have to tune in. Well, I will. We'll have a treat, right, John? We'll have a treat for everybody. We won't share. You just have to. It's a cliffhanger now. It's it's going to be a departure from the norm. That's all we can say. Yeah, you bet, John. Well, thanks for everything, John. Appreciate you so much uh, in upstate New York. Be safe. Thank you, Jeremy. Take care, everybody.